This episode, and others like it, are made possible by the generous support of my patrons on Patreon. If you'd like to help support this channel, and get early access to every video, plus our patrons-only Discord server, consider becoming a patron by following the link below. There's no reason for intellectual property to exist. This week, we're looking at how and why we should abolish this idea to replace it with something better. First things first, let's talk about insulin. Insulin is a life-saving drug. It can be the difference between a pretty normal, long life and the constant risk of ketoacidosis, diabetic coma, and premature death for millions of people around the world. And yet, despite only costing $10 to produce a vial's worth, about one in five Americans with diabetes can't afford treatment and need to ration their insulin. That's because insulin is way too expensive. In the US, it's estimated that insulin prices jump between 15 and 17% every single year. Today, a 10 mil vial costs around $300, when it used to be just 20 bucks back in 1996. In this country, monthly insulin costs regularly exceed $1,000 for those without insurance. So many diabetics in the US have had to resort to incredibly dangerous strategies to get to the end of the month, like not eating, not testing their blood sugar level, or simply not giving their body the amount of insulin it needs. At the core of this problem, and many, many others, is the concept of intellectual property. Currently, the different patents to produce insulin are held by three companies in the US, Eli Lilly, Novo Nordisk, and Sanofi. Together, they control about 90% of the insulin market. And through the yearly tradition of patenting minuscule changes to their process and formula, they've made sure that no generic version of the drug can be manufactured by anybody else. Thanks to intellectual property laws, just three companies have a fully legal cartel. An oligopoly. And all of this despite the formula for synthetic insulin being a hundred years old at this point, and the original creators selling the first patent for only a dollar. Refusing to rake in massive profits for their invention in the hopes it would be universally accessible someday. The story is almost identical with COVID vaccines. Just a couple companies own the patents to the most effective ones, and have been on a price gouging spree for years at this point. Seeing ahead of time how this would play out, all the way back in October of 2020, India, South Africa, and over a hundred other countries went to the World Trade Organization to request that intellectual property restrictions be waived on COVID vaccines, testing, and treatment so that they could actually try to limit the dangers of this already deadly virus. But the patent owners are powerful. And so is the US, the country where most of these patents are registered. So they made sure they would stay quote unquote protected. Notably by hiring over a hundred lobbyists to make sure their IP wouldn't be released to anyone. These companies, through the US's leadership, made sure that the WTO would refuse to waive existing restrictions, which it did for over 600 days, dragging out the pandemic for months while infections continued to spread. When finally these restrictions were waived, not too long ago, and millions of preventable deaths later, the WTO's plan didn't even include waiving IP protections for tests or treatments, only vaccines. So, like with just about everything, poorer countries are forced to face the consequences of a disease we can mitigate and control without adequate resources. Not because we don't have the means to produce them, but because the knowledge required to do so is held for ransom. And the consequences are grim. According to Oxfam, for every life lost in a rich country, another four people have died in a poorer nation due to COVID. There is no doubt that universal access to COVID-related IP would have made a difference. In their attempt to justify this ghoulish behavior, pharma companies have argued that this is about protecting innovation. That without strong exclusionary IP laws, they'd have no incentive to produce these vaccines and innovation would just shrivel up. But they don't even believe this themselves. These same companies now defending IP laws like it's their favorite Minecraft streamer getting cancelled on Twitter are the same companies who, right at the start of the pandemic, desperately clamored for IP laws to be dropped in order to develop the vaccines we know today. This has nothing to do with innovation and everything to do with profit. Like everyone else who defends IP, they're kicking away the ladder. Using publicly available knowledge, or in this case, going around existing IP laws to develop something, then once they're on top, acting like IP laws are sacred natural rights that the state must protect at any cost, including tremendous loss of life. Climbing the ladder, then kicking it away so no one else can do the same. And who can blame them? 
this strategy works. The US has been doing the exact same thing for years. To become the industrial powerhouse of the 19th and 20th centuries, the US encouraged and actively engaged in IP theft. Once upon a time, Britain had kickstarted the Industrial Revolution, and in the process, set up laws to make sure its innovations wouldn't get out. It had used processes and resources it had stolen across the world, and now it was time to kick the ladder. But the US didn't like lagging behind. So some of the country's founding fathers made sure that any industrial spy willing to bring over the new technology of water-powered textile mills and those dope mechanical looms everyone was talking about would be legally protected in the US. So that's what happened. The first industrial machine in the country, this textile mill in Rhode Island, widely considered the birthplace of the American Industrial Revolution, wasn't the product of American genius and innovation, nor of the strength of IP laws, but plain and simple IP theft. Today though, now that it's at the top of the ladder, it's America's turn to kick. On the international stage, the US preaches the sanctity of IP laws, and has even built an international system of enforcement to go with it. On the rhetorical front, the US will often claim that China steals hundreds of billions of dollars a year from the US through IP theft, an amount that's calculated by assuming every counterfeit good sold for cheap is equivalent to losing a sale of the expensive original version, which obviously it's not. Most people buy things when they're cheap, meaning any IP theft calculation you see is almost guaranteed to be inflated. Regardless, the US is basically complaining about China doing the same thing it did all those years ago when it was in the same position, developing in the shadow of a wealthier hegemon. Alongside this more symbolic pressure though, the US and the rest of the Imperial Corps have also set up TRIPS, the Agreement on Trade-Related Aspects of Intellectual Property Rights. TRIPS is an international pact signed by just about every country in the world to police the kind of IP theft that the US so handsomely profited from earlier in its development. While the World Trade Organization tries to portray TRIPS as a benevolent global enforcement system, all it actually does is grant powerful countries legal protections over their IP monopolies, while keeping poorer countries down. That's because rich countries are almost always sellers of IP, thanks to centuries of exploitation of the global south, and poor countries are almost always buyers. A system like TRIPS that enforces the same IP protections for everyone, regardless of how much intellectual property they're actually able to produce, therefore effectively locks poor countries into total dependence on Western IP, since the funds that would otherwise go towards developing new technologies and expanding on the innovations that start out in the West are instead spent buying basic IP from the only legal sellers. As if all this wasn't bad enough, there's a possibility that IP laws may become even more important in coming years. Studies have shown that copyright-intensive industries, like motion pictures, publishing, and software, are seeing their profit margins grow over time, whereas more material-driven industries, like construction, transportation, and mining, are on the decline. It is increasingly safe to profit with IP, and risky to go down the traditional path. Market rules being what they are, investors will follow the money. But this doesn't just mean more movies and songs. In the book Four Futures, Life After Capitalism, author Peter Fraes takes this trend to its logical conclusion and imagines what chasing IP profits might turn into. And it doesn't look good. In a hypothetical world where material scarcity has been overcome, where profits are no longer made by taking real things, transforming them, and selling them for more, Capitalists will seek refuge from irrelevancy by holding on to intellectual property. IP owners would sit at the top of society, only needing to hire a small class of creators to produce the property for them, marketers to sell it, and lawyers to fight IP disputes, reducing the rest of society to simple consumers, blocked behind paywalls to access products protected by IP laws without the ability to actually enjoy the fact that abundance is possible and that no one would technically need to lack anything. The world would have seemingly infinite resources, limited only by the parasitic need to find profit somewhere. Fraze's thought experiment is an extreme example of how far things might go, but what it ultimately highlights is something we already know exists today. Capitalism requires scarcity to function, and in the absence of material scarcity, intellectual property allows capitalists to maintain it artificially to our collective detriment. And look, I know that so far I've talked at a very macro scale, 
either in terms of millions of people, countries, or entire future societies. But this is probably not what you expected from this video. The first thing that comes to everyone's mind with IP is artists, authors, musicians, inventors. Basically any sort of independent creator. IP usually is not sold to us as a way to protect big pharmaceutical companies' profits or the privilege of a small class of IP owners. It's usually about sticking up for the little guy, making sure that when they create something, someone more powerful and capable can't come in and rip them off. And if IP actually did that, it really would be great. But the reality is that that's not who IP actually benefits. That doesn't mean these concerns aren't valid, and I'll address them when I sketch out the socialist alternative to IP later. But as it stands, that's just not who IP protects. On the contrary, large companies, most notably in the tech sector, have weaponized IP against independent creatives and smaller competitors. By filing thousands of patents a year, companies like Apple and Google have created portfolios that they can bring into the courtroom. Whenever Apple sniffs out that someone is innovating down a path they're interested in for themselves, they'll go fishing in their portfolio of purposefully and necessarily vague patents to find something similar that they already own. They'll then take their competition to court, drowning smaller fish in years-long expensive disputes that Apple has the budget to win and that most others don't. In a complete reversal of what we're told IP law is supposed to do, the little guy is absolutely screwed over. And this is not even addressing how companies claim their workers' IP as their own, or publishing houses and record labels, where IP is siphoned up and away from creators, landing in the hands of a class of rent-seeking capitalists who produce nothing and simply have the means to acquire the rights to the work of others. So, given all these problems, given the natural monopolies that IP creates, the price gouging, the loss of life traded for profit, the stifling of innovation, and everything else, what might a socialist alternative look like? Here are a few ideas, and if you have more, by all means, put them in the comments. Obviously, the first thing that a socialist society should do is make sure information is free. That means that it should be both free to circulate everywhere, and not cost anything to the person consuming it, for lack of a better word. This doesn't mean, however, that it shouldn't be compensated. A key socialist criticism of capitalism is that it appropriates workers' labor for the propertied class. So any socialist society where money is still a necessity can't be doing something similar to its intellectual producers. As both a way to compensate and incentivize intellectual production then, a socialist society could go down a few different paths. Socialist governments could establish various funds, like an art fund, an engineering fund, or a fund for researchers in applied sciences. Like the grant system that exists today, people would apply to a democratic board for funding to conduct research or produce something with the stipulation that whatever they create enters the public domain once it's done. The labor has been compensated, but no monopoly over the knowledge has been established, and it can circulate freely, helping someone else stand on the shoulders of their fellow giants. These funds could be accompanied by investment programs into communal resources that help innovation writ large. Like investing more into properly equipped science labs in schools, for example, in order to set a baseline from which anyone can have access to resources without seeking specific project-based approval. In addition, universities and other research institutions could obviously be staffed with people hired specifically to conduct R&D or produce creative work year-round like exists today, without patents or IP claims being filed once the research is done. Since it's possible for this infrastructure to reject or otherwise not apply to some creators, a socialist society could also create a more decentralized platform for crowdfunding. On this platform, people could propose the projects they're interested in creating, set a price according to the labor it would require to bring into the world, and if enough people agree that this is a worthwhile idea, they'd chip in and it would happen. Here again, people would be paid for their work, but the thing they produce would be accessible to all for free. And the kind of freeloading that exists in any sort of system where money changes hands would be minimized by the fact that projects that don't get funded don't see the light of day. So if you want something to happen, you probably need to chip in. In all these ideas, labor is properly compensated without an extractive monopoly forming after the fact. You are still incentivized to innovate and can even get paid, so we're not exclusively relying on people creating for the fun of it, and what you produce can actually be used by everyone who might benefit from it, not just those who can afford it. 
In parallel, a sort of patent office could still exist under socialism, but only to keep track of the various intellectual products and prevent fraud. For example, to make sure that something you didn't write isn't being distributed with your name on it, or that something you did write isn't being passed off by someone else as their original work. It wouldn't grant you a monopoly over pricing, all information circulates freely, but it could protect your reputation, give you proper credit, and serve a larger societal purpose by creating a database where like-minded creators could find each other or get inspired. Again, these are just ideas, and I'll link where I found some of them in the description. You will undoubtedly be able to find problems with some of them, or maybe even come up with better alternatives yourself. They're not here as an official plan or anything, but to communicate the fact that there are alternatives. IP almost always has disastrous and unjustified consequences. Innovations that are the fruit of thousands of different factors, of knowledge accumulated over centuries, resources given for free to a country's citizens like education, public libraries, and publicly funded research get privatized and suddenly become the last link in the chain. Incremental work done by thousands of people suddenly stops being passed on freely from one person to the next as soon as intellectual property is claimed. While creating IP laws might incentivize innovation for one person, guaranteeing them a monopoly over the pattern they produce, it makes it infinitely harder to innovate for the thousands of people who will come after them and will have to deal with however this monopoly over information is handled. IP laws put a barrier between what a person creates and how others might use it, getting in the way of the development of new ideas and forcing everyone to try to come up with new knowledge without drawing the ire of IP tyrants. There's nothing natural about intellectual property rights, or any private property rights for that matter. They aren't handed down to us by God or the universe. They were created by capitalist and liberal thinkers to justify and enforce a calculated system of exploitation. We can easily come up with something better. A better, more innovative world is possible. I mentioned at the beginning of this video that this kind of content is made possible by my patrons on Patreon. As you can probably imagine, YouTube doesn't like to promote left-wing political content. I've gotten a lot of reports recently of people not getting notified of my new videos, even if they have the bell clicked. Because of this, I'm having to rely more heavily on viewers like you to maintain my channel. If you like the kind of videos I'm producing, and you're able to chip in even a dollar a month, I would greatly appreciate the support. As a little show of that appreciation, every patron, regardless of donation amount, gets early access to every video, plus access to our patrons-only Discord server. It's a really fun place to hang out. We have everything from a recommended reading list, to a book club, to special channels for our neurodivergent and LGBT comrades. I also try to do a live Q&A with patrons every month, which is always a good time. We've built a great little community, and we'd love for you to be part of it. So if you'd like to help support my channel, join the Discord, and get early access to every video, consider becoming a patron at patreon.com secondthought. If you enjoyed this video, consider dropping a like. If you hated it, a thumbs down. You can check out my previous content by clicking the links on your screen. Thanks for watching, and I'll see you next week.